uh, Luke chapter 2, Luke's gospel, the 8th verse. And there's some significance uh, in this uh, text that I want to draw your attention to before uh, I read the text. We're going to find this announcement of the birth of Christ coming to some shepherds in a field. I've always been really drawn to the truth that the very first announcement of the birth of Christ was to shepherds. Why not the chief priest? Why not the religious leaders? Why not the Pharisees or the Sadducees or, uh, or the disciples even? I mean, what? why? Think about it. Why to the shepherds? And, and when you begin to understand, shepherds are the outcasts of society, right? They, they're the ones that are excommunicated from the temple. They're considered unclean. And even at the announcement of the birth of Christ, Jesus is, and God is revealing to us that Jesus is a Savior for all people. Jesus is a Savior for all people. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. No matter how much brokenness you have in your life, the Messiah is for you. He's for all people. Sometimes we can get into this Christian mindset that Jesus came for churchy people. He didn't. He came for lost people. And by the way, at one time you were lost too. And, and you know, self-righteousness can begin to creep up. And, and man, if we're honest, none of us are good. There's, the Bible says there's none good, there's none righteous, only Jesus, right? He's the only good one, he's the only perfect one, he's the only righteous one. The rest of us, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But even at the announcement, we see this awesome truth that Jesus is going to be a savior for all the people. And the announcement to the shepherds in this field while they're watching over their flocks by night. You know, if Jesus would have been, if his announcement, if he'd have been born you know, in the temple, rightfully so, um, certain people couldn't have accessed him. But he was accessible to all mankind, even at his birth. And I just want you to know this morning, no matter where you're at, no matter where you've been, it doesn't matter what your skin color is, it doesn't matter what your economic status is, it doesn't matter what your gender is, Jesus is accessible to you this morning. He is accessible to you. You can call upon him. The Bible says, for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And as you study the New Testament, there's only one group and classification of people that Jesus ever turned away from him. And that's those that were full of themselves. If you come to Jesus full of yourself, he'll turn you away every time. But if you come empty, if you come broken, in need of forgiveness, in need of a Savior, Jesus will receive you into his kingdom. That's another sermon for another day. Somebody say amen. Amen. Let's jump into the text. Luke chapter 2, verse number 8. Stand with me if you would as we give reverence to the reading of God's word. Luke 2 and 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Try to envision this, man. Just try to to wrap your mind around this. Verse number 9, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. They're waiting, they're expecting, they're anticipating the Messiah to come. And the angel of the Lord appears to them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And notice what the Bible says, and they were filled with fear. Don't forget that. Verse 10. And and the angel said to them, if you're a note taker, go ahead and jot this down or, or underline this if you want to. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Notice he didn't say good news for some of the people. He didn't say, I'm bringing you news for the good people. He says, I'm bringing you good news for all of the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
Try to envision the angel of the Lord meeting you in a field at nighttime and, and making this announcement, this, this announcement that the people of God have been waiting upon generation after generation, lifetime after lifetime, and this angel comes and makes this announcement, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. But notice, the Bible says this, when the glory of the Lord shone round about them, they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. What a message of hope in that day. And, and just tucked away in this Christmas announcement is also a message of hope for you and I today. And it is this tiny little two-word message that God is still wanting to echo through the ages of time, and it is this, fear not. Fear not. This world gives us a lot of things to be fearful of, but God is echoing through the the channels of history, the timeless message, the same message that he shared through the angel of the Lord that first Christmas morning, do not fear. Fear not. Bow with me in prayer. Father, we love you this morning. God, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather together with your people. And Lord, we want to be fed by you. God, we want you to speak to us, Lord. And we pray that you would open up the scriptures this morning, God. We don't want uh, opinions, God. We don't want the commandments of men, God. We want the pure word of God. And so, Lord, we ask you, God, to speak to us as the scriptures are opened, as the scriptures are declared, as the scriptures are proclaimed. God, take your word and do something with it of eternal significance this morning. God, we acknowledge that except the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. So, God, do, mighty God, what only you can do in this place. Lord, I'm thankful that you know every man, woman, boy, and girl that's assembled here together. Lord, some may have thought that they would come into this place by accident this morning. But God, you brought them by divine appointment to speak a word into their lives. And so that word is going to be your word. And so Lord, as James said, let us receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise for all that you do this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said... You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So right here in the middle of this Christmas announcement, there's this, this thought that the angel of the Lord shares with the shepherds, do not fear. And as a matter of fact, as you really study the Christmas story, this is not the first time this message comes in the Christmas story. Back in Luke chapter 1, when the angel of the Lord, the same angel of the Lord appears to Zechariah um, to announce the birth of their son, John the Baptist, to him and Elizabeth, verse number 12 says this, and Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him, right? And it says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Now there are some that have suggested that the shepherds and Zechariah were just really experiencing the fear of the Lord. The Bible says the fear of the Lord, there is a healthy fear of the Lord. The scripture says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This is really the beginning of a relationship with God that we acknowledge that God is God and we are not. It's this healthy reverence, it's this healthy awe of who God is. He's not the man upstairs, he is God Almighty. That is the fear of the Lord, and, and, and what I would suggest to you is that is not what they were experiencing, because notice what the, the, the angel of the Lord says, do not have this type of fear. If they had the fear of the Lord, the angel would have encouraged it. You need to have the fear of the Lord. And so there's this healthy fear of the Lord. And then there's this irrational fear, right, that, that, they, were, that they were having. And, and, and so this is what it says. And the angel of the Lord said to them, fear not, for I bring to you good news of great joy that will be to all the people. So one of the things the Christmas story reminds us is that we do not, as the people of God, hear me out this morning, we do not have to live our lives bound by fear. 
We do not as the people of God. It doesn't mean that we won't struggle. It doesn't mean that we won't have temptations. It doesn't mean that, that fear won't try to grip our lives because it will. But we do not have to live lives enslaved to fear. What is fear? Some say, well, isn't fear and anxiety the same thing? No, it's not. Anxiety is just this generalized uncertainty. Fear, on the other hand, has legitimate um, concerns or a legitimate threat associated with it in the here and now. There is a legitimate threat before you, and there is an opportunity to be fearful, okay? It, so a person that's anxious, sometimes they can't put their finger on it. There's, I don't know why, but I'm just feeling uncertain. And, and the Bible speaks about how that we should not be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication we make our requests known unto God. But fear, on the other hand, there's this legitimate threat that is before us. And God gave us this coping mechanism in our bodies to experience this healthy fear at times. Um, if you are driving down the road and you hear, and you're speeding and you hear sirens and blue lights and red lights flashing behind you, God gave you that healthy sense of fear to pull over as fast as you can. You know, you got that. Now, if you grew up like I grew up, you're always scared when the cops are behind you, right? It wasn't up to no good and it's just never a good thing. And so, but, but there's this healthy sense of fear that we have. But what the enemy does is he takes this, this legitimate threat that is before us and this, this rational fear that God gave us and the enemy takes that and, and blows it into some irrational fear. And so what the enemy does is he tries to paralyze the people of God with irrational fears. And it is a primary weapon that the enemy uses. And everybody look right up here. It doesn't matter how spiritual that you are. It doesn't matter how long that you've served God. You are not exempt the enemy battling you with fear. It is legitimate threats that come in to our lives. We live in a sin-cursed fallen world that things will happen that are simply just beyond our control. Here's the reality. Here's where the rubber meets the road. This is, uh, this is really the... the, the, the idea behind the message this morning is that fear grips us when we believe that despite our best efforts to prevent it, something undesirable is going to happen and we cannot stop it. There's nothing that we can do about it. So what is our response as the people of God? How do we respond? Why do we not have to fear? The first thing that I want you to see, number one, is we do not have to live in fear because the scripture is true. We do not have to live our lives bound up by fear because the scripture is true. Fear, on the other hand, an irrational fear is a lie and a deception. See, what the enemy does is the enemy will convince you that your irrational fears, see, you've got this legitimate threat that is before you, and the enemy takes that and twists it into an irrational fear, and the enemy deceives you and convinces you many a times that your irrational fear is going to be your reality. That's a lie. It's a deception. This is how this is. One of the ways that the enemy operates in our world takes an irrational fear in our lives and convinces us that this is going to be our reality. It's even proven scientifically that this is not the case. See, irrational fears are always wrapped up in worst case scenarios. Anyone else ever uh, prone to thinking about worst case scenarios all the time? Does your mind drift? Oftentimes, to what is the worst case scenario in the situation that I'm facing. Remember, fear is, is facing legitimate threats, not some make-believe thing. There are real things that come into our lives that cause us to have healthy fear, but the enemy takes those and they become irrational fears. And, and so many times that this comes up in our lives, and, and, and think about it. It's, it's just unbelievable how this works. I, in my family, I have my oldest daughter, is terrified of bees. Now, I'm allergic to bees. My mom can attest when I was younger, at one point, some point in my childhood, I got a bee sting and my arm swelled up. I had to go 
to the doctor, and they said, they gave me this shot. It's called the EpiPen. Anyone? Uh, by the way, I still have your EpiPen, Patsy. Thank you. I couldn't afford one for years, and she had one laying around. It's in my drawer at home. Uh, but my daughter has heard me talk about bee stings, and she's heard me talk about my arm swelling up. And, and mind you, she's 12 years old. She has never, ever been stung by a bee, but she's terrified by them. I'm talking to you beyond a phobia terrified by bees so here's what happens if you are afraid of bees when you see a bee your irrational fear tells you you're going to be stung by that bee because so you got a legitimate threat right this is before you you're in the presence of bees you're afraid of bees what the irrational fear tells you is that you're going to be stung by that bee it's not true it's not always the case right there's a possibility but the, the chances are very small just because you pass by a bee that you are going to be stung by a bee. Any of you afraid of heights? Anyone in here just afraid of heights? Okay. Legitimate threat. When you find yourself in a high place, you've got a legitimate threat before you. You're in a place that you're uncomfortable being. What fear, irrational fear tells you is you're going to fall. So you start to hyperventilate. You start your your heart starts to beat fast. You start to sweat. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Am I talking to you? Down on your level, your palms start getting sweaty, and, and all of a sudden you're convincing yourself, I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall. No, you're not going to fall. That's irrational fear in your life, right? If you're, a play, if you're afraid of planes, anybody in here be honest enough to admit that I'm afraid of getting on a plane? If you're afraid of planes, when you get on a plane, irrational fear tells you you're going to crash before you land. By the way, let me just throw this out there for you. Do you know that it is way safer to travel by plane than it is by automobile? But what I've noticed is this. Since we are in the air capital of the world, somebody say amen, and, and we are uh, in, uh, in the presence of uh, Hawker Beechcraft and Raytheon and Spirit Aero Systems and Boeing, what I've learned is a lot of people that are afraid of planes worked on the planes. They know how the people came to work. Man, they come hung over. They come, they didn't sleep. And, and man, they, they got everything on their mind and they're driving rivets in the wrong places and they're saying, I am never getting on a plane. I helped build those planes. I'll never ride in one. I'm talking to you about irrational fears. Even science tells us, they studies prove that 90% of the things that we worry about never come to pass. 90% of the things, the worst case scenarios that come to our mind, they're never going to happen, but yet uh, irrational fear tells us every one of those are going to happen in our lives. Everybody look right up here. Even though science tells us that our hope for our fears is not found in science. It's not. The hope for your fears is not found in science. The hope for your fears is found in God's Word. And the hope that we have is found, centered solely and completely in the Word of God. See, what we need to understand is fear is a big deal in the story of us and God. It really is. And in and, and the Scripture, the, the commandment that is most repeated throughout the Word of God is this idea, do not fear fear not over and over and some have added up all these commands in scripture and have found that there are 366 mentions of fear not found in the scripture one for every day of the year and an extra one for leap year what are you saying God has all the bases covered God's got all of our days numbered and God understands that, that, that we don't have to be fearful because we have him. And so we know what the remedy is. People say, don't live your life by fear, but live your life by what? Faith. Don't live your life in fear. The antidote for fear is faith. And how does the scripture say that we have faith? Faith, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes forth by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. Not from science. Not just because studies tell us that 90% of the things uh, that we worry about are never going to come to pass. So don't be jotting down, okay, these are 10 things that I'm worried about. I can scratch nine of them off. No, don't turn to the scientific studies. Turn to the Word of God. Turn to the Word of God because the Word of God is our hope for our fears. And this is how that we can know 
that we don't have to live our lives uh, bound up by fear. And so the promises of God revealed in Scripture are true for us. In the same way the angel of the Lord spoke to the shepherds, in the same way the angel of the Lord spoke to Zechariah, the same God is speaking to us today through his word, and he is saying, you might have legitimate threats before you. There may be some things in your life you don't understand, but even though those things are reality, you still don't have to live your life in fear. Why? Because the word of God is true. What does the scripture say about fear? Let's walk through some of these things. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. It's interesting, Paul says that fear is a spirit. So what can a spirit, it is not the Holy Spirit of God, it is a spirit. What do spirits do? Well, I'll tell you what they do is they control you. Okay? A spirit, if, if, if there's a spirit of something in your life, it means that you're being controlled by that, right? It consumes you. A spirit will consume you. It, it affects every area of your life. And so people that are living with irrational fears, they are literally consumed and controlled by these fears. And, and the Word of God speaks into our lives. It speaks into our legitimate threats that we're looking at. There were some things in life we just have to stare them right into the, to, to the center of what they are because the, unfortunately, just because we're saved, just because we're born again, just because we're followers of Jesus does not exempt us from living in the real life. So we're going to face some things. We're going to go through some things. But while we are facing these legitimate threats, God speaks into our lives and says he has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. I love 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has, not, has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Who is perfect love? Jesus is perfect love. Greater love has no man than this, than he that would lay down his life for his friends. So you could really, in a sense, you could put Jesus there instead of perfect love, and that scripture would say, there is no fear in love, but Jesus cast out all fear. Jesus cast out, because fear, notice what the scripture says, because fear has to do with punishment. Listen, God is not punishing, God doesn't punish his children. God does correct his children, he never punishes his children. And fear torments. And so we know that God would never send something into our life that is going to torment us so that we know that whenever we're being consumed by irrational fears, we know when we're being controlled by irrational fears, that is not from God. Because perfect love casts out fear. I love what the psalmist said in Psalm 34. He said, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. Not some of my fears, not the little fears, not the mid-sized fears, not just the big fears, but all of my fears. God is still in the delivery business this morning. God is a God who can deliver you from the spirit of fear, from the irrational fear that is trying to control your life. Psalm 118.6 says this, the Lord is on my side. Is anybody thankful the Lord is on your side? The Lord is on my side. And by the way, if you are facing an army and it's just you and God, anytime you have God, you are the majority. You can face an army of a million, but as long as God is on your, it can just be you and God, but you are the majority. It doesn't matter how many are against you. If the Lord is on your side, you don't have to be afraid. So the psalmist, he says, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear for what can man do to me? Man can't do anything to me when the Lord is on my side. So what we have to do is that when we have legitimate threats in our lives that the enemy twists into irrational fears, what we have to do is that we have to face those irrational fears and confront them with the Word of God. Why? Because we have to face the deception, we have to face the lie with the truth. And the way that we do that is through the Word of God. So what we have to learn to do is to speak the Word of God to our fears. That's how you confront the Word of God. And there will be times in your life that you'll have to, that fear will creep in and you will have to confront the fear with the truth 
and the word of God is true. We do not fear because the scripture is true. If you believe it, shout a big amen this morning. Number two, we do not live in fear because God is sovereign. We do not have to live bound by fear because God is sovereign. The sovereignty of God is one of the grandest and deepest truths presented in all of God's, uh, uh, of the scripture concerning God's control for the universe that he created it. By the way, if God is powerful enough to create the universe, he's powerful enough to sustain it. That's really what the sovereignty of God is all about, is that if God said in the beginning, if God said let there be light and there was light, if God is that powerful, he's powerful enough to control what he's created. Right? That's really kind of the, the idea behind the sovereignty of God. I love what John Piper said about God's sovereignty. Notice this, and I quote, God is powerful and authoritative to the extent of being able to override all other powers and authorities, end of quote. Let me say that again for you. God is powerful and authoritative to the extent of being able to override all other powers and authorities. So picture it this way. You have God's power, you have God's authority, then you have other powers, and you have other authorities. God's power and God's authority is so far higher than all other powers and authorities that God's power can override other powers. God's authority can override all other authorities. What are you trying to say today, preacher, that God is completely in control? We, we don't have to fear. We don't have to live our lives bound up in the spirit of fear because God is completely in control. Nothing can stop God's plan or purposes. Nothing can thwart the purpose of God. Think about this. There's nothing that can come into your life, notice this, that has not first passed through the hand of God and the sovereignty of God. So here's the question for you. If God knows about it, why should we fear it? If God's aware of it, why do we have to be afraid of it? But what happens is, is in our flesh, is that we sometimes in the midst of our legitimate threats that are before us, we begin to lower our view of God. We somehow, some way think that, well, here's my fear and here's my threat and this is what's before me and God's kind of checked out. He's somewhere over here. I don't think he's really concerned. I don't think he's really aware. I'm not really sure if he loves me. I don't know if he's really all powerful. And so kind of what we do is we bring God from way up here and we put God way down here. And next thing you know, we got our fears and our threats way up here and God way down here. What we need to do is get our God where he belongs and our fears where they belong. That's what we need to do. We need to put God back up on his rightful throne. He's in control. He's sovereign over all things. And so if God knows about it, if God is aware of it, why do we need to be fearful of it? Why should we be afraid? Consider some of the ways God's sovereignty is revealed in Scripture. Number one, God is sovereign over nature. Psalm 135, 7, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. You say, God can't do that. God can do whatever he wants to do. He's God. He's God. Nobody tells God what he can and can't do. The Lord does whatever he pleases. And whatever he does in heaven and on earth, in the sea and in the deeps, he it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain and brings forth wind from the storehouses. Matthew 8, 27, speaking of Jesus, says this, What sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? God is sovereign even over nature. God is sovereign over animals. Listen to Matthew 10 and 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father knowing it. There's not a bird that falls from the sky that God is not aware of. He is sovereign even over the animals. Here's one for you. Some of you all up in arms over what's happening in America right now. God is sovereign over the nations. God is sovereign over the nations. Second Chronicles 20 and 6. You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none are able to withstand you. Psalm 33:10. The Lord brings the council of nations to nothing. 
He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. I love what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 40 concerning the nations. He says, all of the nations of the world are as a drop in the bucket to God. You think about all of the nations who think they're powerful. You think about the United States of America. You think about China. You think about Indonesia. And you think about um, all of these different countries, um, you know, in the Middle East, Iran and Israel. And, and, and picture a five-gallon bucket, okay? You got this five-gallon bucket that's here. And then you go get you a little dropper, you know, a little medicine dropper. And you, you get a, one drop of water in that dropper. And you put it in that five-gallon bucket, just one drop in the five-gallon bucket. And the Word of God says this, all of the nations, America, all of these powerful nations are but a drop in the bucket to our God. See, nations only think they have power. God has all power under heaven and earth. There is no nation that has the power that are. And I thank God for America. I love America. It's the, I believe the greatest country on planet Earth. And God has shed his grace on America. And I believe that we need to continue to fight for the freedoms that we have in America. And we ought to love the country that we have. But understand me this morning. All of the nations, however many, 263, whatever the, the number is. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been in high school, by the way, if you can't tell. However many countries there are and how many nations there are, you put them all together Put one little drop in a five-gallon bucket, and that's what all those nations are before God. He is sovereign over the nations. Not only is he sovereign over the nations, but he's sovereign over human decisions. Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And then Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. God is even sovereign over the human decisions in life. You say, but don't we have a free will? Yes, we do have a free will. God did not create you as a robot. God did not create you as a puppet. And, and, and what we have to understand is that, that we have the sovereignty of God taught in Scripture. We have deep doctrines concerning the election of, uh, of God. Predestination is taught in Scripture. And free will is taught in scripture. You say, well, how do those all mesh together? I don't know. The Bible says this, God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And I love what Brother Dan said years ago. If we could ever figure out everything there is to know about God, he wouldn't be God. Think about it. If you could figure out God, he's not God anymore. He's higher than we are. His ways are higher than our, th our ways. His thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. And what we see is that we have free will. The Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. God's not going to force you to serve him. God's not going to force you to live for him. God's not going to force you to surrender your will to him. You're going to have to do that on your own. But then there's also taught the election that God elects and God predestinates. And, and, and we see all of these meshed together in Scripture. And the only way that it is worked out is in the infinite mind of a holy God, a powerful and a mighty God. We do not fear because God is sovereign. If you believe it, say amen this morning. Last but not least... Number three, we do not fear because God's Spirit lives in us. We do not have to live bound by fear because God's Spirit lives, dwells in us. The Scripture, once again, I want to reiterate this. The Scripture teaches that fear is a spirit. God has not given us the spirit of fear, okay? But, but God's Spirit, is the fear of, as a spirit is not the Spirit of God. And God's Spirit is the one who lives, He lives inside of us, and the Spirit of God bears witness to that which is true. Listen to what Jesus said in John 14, verses 15, concerning the Spirit of God. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You ever heard somebody, or you ever seen a bumper sticker that says, honk if you love Jesus? I've got one for you. Obey him if you love Jesus. Anybody can honk. If you love Jesus, live your life for him. Thank all three of you for the amen there. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Title of the Holy Spirit, capital H, helper. To be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. This is, this is important. The spirit of God is the spirit of truth. Remember, fear is a what? Fear is a liar. Don't forget it. Fear is a liar. The spirit of God is the spirit of truth. Notice this. Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. Not only is he with us, he is in us. Jesus says the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, not only dwells with you, but he now dwells in you. And so when he dwells in you, there is no place for fear in your life. Why? Because the Spirit of God, God who lives in us, He bears witness to that which is true. And when the Spirit of God is being fed by the Word of God, this is why it's important. You say, man, I've, I've heard it my whole, whole life. I need to read my Bible. I need to read my Bible. I need to read my Bible. You need to read your Bible not just for information, not just for knowledge, so that you can live victoriously. Because there's an enemy that's against you. Facts aren't going to get you to heaven. Knowledge is, it, it, if anything, it puffs up. That's, we, we need the, the Word of God energized by the Spirit of God in our lives to help us live victoriously because we have a real enemy that brings legitimate threats into our lives that wants to turn those legitimate threats into irrational fears. But the Spirit of God in us bears witness to what is truth. And so when we are being convinced by the enemy that all these things are going to happen irrationally, we know that's not true. Why? Because the Spirit of God lives in us. And we can return back to what is true. That doesn't mean that we will not face temptations of fear. This does not mean that we will not face seasons of fear. Nor does it mean that we will not even give into fear at times even as Christians. But what it does mean, and notice this, is that fear will not control us permanently as the children of God. Fear will not have the final say in our lives as the children of God. It will not get the final story in our lives because we are the children of God. We're going to go through some things. We're going to face some things. We're going to face some temptations of irrational fears. Man, if you would have told me, I went through a battle of fear. It's hard to believe it's almost eight years ago. Eight years ago that, that I was in the dark night of the soul in my life for three to four months. I, it, it's, it's hard to explain that I'm a child of God, I'm a pastor of a growing church, and my life was controlled by fear at the same time. I mean, it, it had gotten to the point where it was completely out of control. There was all these circumstances, my daughter going in to the brain surgery, going to have to start chemotherapy, and, and all these just different things, that the, the, the pressure of life, my son had just been born, and what are we going to do, and it's like, man, I gave in for a season, and, and fear, but if you would have told me when I first got saved, that there would be a time in my Christian life that I would face a battle with fear, I would have laughed at you, I would have scorned you. When God saved me, I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof. I promise you, there wasn't nothing that could touch me. The change that God did in my life, it was so dramatic, it was so real that I knew that God inside of me was bigger than anything that I could face in this life. And, and, and whatever it is, come what may, God is going to overcome. God is going to persevere in my life. But here's the thing, and, here, and the music team can go ahead and come. Here's the thing. God's Spirit lives in us, and God's Spirit wants to control us. What we have to do is that we have to make sure as the people of God, we leave no room for fear in our lives. We should be so full of faith in the Word of God that there's not, because fear doesn't need much. It just needs a crack. It just needs a crevice to sneak into your life to become irrational to the point that you are now being controlled and consumed by a lie and by a deception. You can ask my wife. I, don't, I didn't talk to a lot of people about it. I was just believing a lot of things that weren't true. I, things were happening in my body that were out of my control. And I promise you this. I haven't told this to a lot of people. But there was a point in this three-month period 
that I really questioned whether I would be normal again or not. I, I really wondered if I was going to end up in a mental asylum. But I'm a pastor, but I'm a child of God, but I'm a Christian filled with God's Holy Spirit. Be careful what you say you'll never struggle with. Be careful what you say that you'll never have a problem with in this life. God's taught me how to be more humble. You say, well, has all of that made you a better pastor? No, but it's made me a more um, understanding pastor. It's made me a more compassionate pastor. Because now I understand that it's real. It's not make-believe. People that are struggling with mental illness, it's not something, oh, just get over it. You just don't get over it. It's not how it works. It's not. We've got to be understanding. We've got to be compassionate. And we've got to learn how to confront our fears with the Word of God and with the truth empowered by the Spirit of God. We do not have to be controlled by fear as the people of God. What a message in the Christmas story. What a message in the announcement of the birth of Christ. Fear not. It's a timeless message. It's a relevant message for America 2020 to church 2020. Each and every one of us needs to hear the message from God this morning. Do not fear, for I am with you, and I dwell in you. Face your legitimate threats, understanding that if God is for me, who can be against me? It's not that I'm not going to face anything in life. I am going to face some things in life, but I'm going to be able to persevere through it because God is greater than what I'm facing.